This is an audio recording of the Lendit Fintech Weekly News Show. The show is streamed live on Lendit TV, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter at 5 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday. In this fast-paced show, the Lendit News team and a special guest discuss the most important fintech news stories of the past week. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, Welcome to the Lendit Fintech Weekly News Show. My name is Peter Renton, Chairman and Co-Founder of Lendit Fintech, and as always, joined by my good friend and colleague, Todd Anderson. How are you doing, Todd? I'm good, Peter. Happy New Year and Happy New Year to the audience. Right. And uh, and joining us back again for the second time, uh, John White. How are you doing, John? Just fine. I was just uh, lamenting the winter weather that is coming upon us, but I not going to complain too loudly. So well, yes, you are, you it are is long, January. You are a long way north uh, in uh, Edmonton, Canada. So it, it tends to get a little chilly up that part. And John, I should just, just mention as well, he is, he is our, our news editor from Leonard Fintech News. So he is joining us today to discuss the news of the week and not a super busy news week. So what I thought we would do is kick off. Um, I wrote a, like a, a fintech trends piece, 2022 trends um, that uh, I think are going to be really, uh, you know, impact the year in fintech. And so I thought we'd just kick it off just with, uh, with that. And I'll just list the list the different trends here that I that I covered. Um, you know, buy now, pay later faces a reckoning. I think uh, whether that's you know, I, I think that's uh, something that we can. Is pretty obvious, really, because there's a lot of regulatory interest. You know, fintech's going public. We're going to talk about another fintech that's come, that went public just today, um, but there's, that is going to continue to be a trend here in 2022. Changes in overdraft fees, my favorite topic here. A lot of movement in 2021. It's going to be interesting to see how that changes, how that um, happens in 2022. Feel like there's going to be even more movement there. Cash flow underwriting. Um, really has become. Well, I'm, I, I, I positioned it as cash flow underwriting becomes the data enrichment layer. I've been hearing a lot about data enrichment. A lot of it based on all the transaction data that we have now. Uh, talked about uh, central bank digital currencies. Uh, we're going to have a lot of movement uh, on China there. The, we are finally going to see, I expect, Project Hamilton, which is the the uh, research project from the. Uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and MIT, which we've been eagerly awaiting since September when it was supposed <laughs> to be out, but uh, should be out soon. Then of then the rise of Web3 in banking. Web3 is a pretty nascent uh, technology when it comes to sort of mainstream finance, but I think we're going to see some inroads there. So anyway, guys, uh, you know, Todd, maybe start with you. What, uh, what caught your attention out of my seven trends? Well, I'll pick up on two. Um, I'll... You know, the two I'm going to say are Web3 and Embedded. I'll start with Embedded because I think that's a bit quicker. Oh, um, I'd actually, I I'd, I'd, I'd think I glossed over Embedded, so I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, Embedded Finance is just becoming ubiquitous. It's, it's, it's going to be natural for you to be in a non-financial app and have a financial offering of some sorts, whether it be a, a checking account or... Uh, a credit card that's you know heavy with rewards to keep you shopping at X store. I mean, everything's going to be very, very seamless on your phone. Uh, and it's going to feel as if it's a, a natural evolution of, of your experience with that brand. Uh, we've seen this um, a lot uh, already, but I think it'll just continue um, to uh, occur and, and it just become a natural extension of, of, um, our daily lives essentially mm-hmm. uh, that we're uh, whatever brand we're interacting with. Um, but you know, the you know, web three has obviously gotten a lot of play. Um, there's a ton of innovation going on. Uh, the, you know, the new internet um, is, you know, has a fascinating evolution to it from even from where we were back when the, the first white paper of Bitcoin dropped and, and to, to where we've evolved to today, the crypto winter and, and the craziness of 2017 and 18. I think the, the most interesting aspect to it is how it intersects and interacts with traditional banking. Uh, because you have traditional banking and their tech here. And then Web3 is like eons 
better, faster over here. Well, those two are really far apart. Uh, and how do we get them closer together? How do we get regulators? And it's really, how do you get banks to change regulators' opinion of some of this stuff? Because regulators move with banks because banks pay lobbyists and lobbyists do a lot of work in Washington. Uh, and so, but the, the fact that more banks have begun some level of interaction with Web3, whether it be small or, or bigger projects, that to me is the key. How does traditional banking and Web3 continue to come towards one another. Because I think eventually, you know, the, the, I think uh, Paolo Passoni, when we were last in person in, in Miami, said it, Web2 and Web3 are going to interact together. It's kind of wh what application of Web3 fits your business best. Um, and that's how I think banks have to think about it as well, not just I'm going from where I am today to Web3. It's how do we begin to incorporate because it's going to be unavoidable at some point. Yeah, it's and getting so much traction, uh, and granted, it still goes in these these ebbs, like you saw Bitcoin and all these other uh, altcoins fell off a cliff the last few days, as regular markets did. So that they're not necessarily a hedge all the time, but to me, that how traditional bank begins to figure out Web three is, is really a fascinating. Uh, journey, and I only think we're at the very, very early stage of that right now. Oh, I'd say too. If you if, if you use the baseball game analogy that everyone likes to likes to bring up, we are in the top of the first, and there's no batters, and it's it's like there's zero outs. It's we're still really... warming up. We're still <laughs> warming up. We, we haven't even said play ball yet. <laughs> right, because particularly when it comes to Web three in banking, I think. I mean, I think if you talk yeah. to Web three folks, they would probably argue that we're, we're a bit further along, but there just really has barely been anything happening. And I, I, should, I should. The only thing I'll end on is it does have to interact with banking at some point. Yes. You, we can, as decentralized a world as, as the crypto enthusiasts want, there's no way that's going to happen the way they want it. So it has to intersect. It has to. Yep. And so how that happens, I think, is hugely crucial not only two Web3 companies interacting with regulators and, and that, but I think banks working with regulators and saying, hey, that we've realized this is also important to us. Now we need to figure out how to make this, this possible. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. The, so the banks are going to be driving it through necessity, and it's the fintechs that agree to work with them in the early stages that will probably rise up. Yep. Yep. For mm -hmm. sure. So what, so what else caught your eye, John, about the, the trends here? I agree with Todd. I'm really optimistic about this year, the embedded finance especially. I think people with the pandemic, people are now comfortable with everything being kind of all in one place. And the one-stop shop idea is very attractive to me. Mm -hmm. So reducing the barriers, the companies that are able to do that will... I think set the set the stage for everyone else to follow, and I'm very much looking forward to that. And it'll give more credibility, I think, to others who are looking to do something similar. And and I'm also really excited about Web three and seeing who is willing to step up and mm -hmm. and start making it happen. And I, and I agree that there's going to be some uh, give and take needed, you know, from from the the real uh, zealots in the space who want to see completely decentralized. Um, there has to be an understanding that for, for this to move forward, you need traditional banking on board. Yep. Although the, the, that's, that's for sure. And I think I, I, I find web three, that's my sort of, I, I made it the last one on my list because it's actually the one I'm, I think is uh, the most interesting. I have to catch myself sometimes. I, I go down the web three rabbit hole because it's, I just find <laughs> it personally so interesting and you can just you can just go down the web. It's infinite. It feels like how far down the rabbit hole you can go yep. uh, in the Web three world. But anyway, let's move on to our regular scheduled programming, shall we say? And the news of the week is that it wasn't a super busy news week. But the first item I want to highlight is something that happened today, or we heard about it on on Monday. But Dave, um, the, not the I'm talking about the uh, the Challenger Bank. Um, dave.com or just the, web, the app dave they went public um well they started trading as a public company let's get out let's get the sort of facts straight here they they merged with a victory park spac 
and um, that 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 closed. I believe it was Tuesday. They uh, they started trading um, under their own ticker today. Um, opened, I think it was like eight twenty seven, eight dollars and twenty seven cents a share. Closed up about three percent to eight fifty three. Not a bad first day, considering how some of the other fintechs have uh, fared on their first day of trading. So, uh, still uh, obviously a long way to go. They they raised two hundred ten million dollars in a pipe. Uh, led by Tiger Global. I don't, I don't see anything about money being raised by the company. And I had Jason Wilk on the podcast uh, just a few weeks ago, and he never, he sort of, it seemed like it was, this is all just going to be like secondary type transactions and no necessarily money coming into them from the, from the actual SPAC transaction itself. Uh, valuation more than $3.2 billion now. You know, Dave is sort of in some ways a quiet achiever, I think, because they've got 10 million members, second, I think, only to Chime. Um, and you don't hear as much about them as you hear about with Chime. But, uh, and they, and the, the, the reason why the reasons I like them so much is because they really started the um, no overdraft fee kind of uh, trend that seeing uh, they started that in 2017 by basically providing overdraft protection and so i'm a big fan of that product overdrafts uh, i think eventually change overdrafts aren't are where they are today without dave right totally uh, or, or or someone like dave but it happened to be dave so they need to get the credit mm-hmm. um you know without them helping to push this idea of um no exorbitant fees for overdrafting just a handful of dollars like the other i think maybe it was before the holidays i think it was i was telling you peter Mm -hmm. i had an alert from chase i'm a chase customer amongst other uh institutions um on my phone says the first 50 dollars that you overdraft no fee that would be that was unheard of yeah from the bank without without chase's size Yeah. yeah And and I think the other thing that they've recently saw, these banks, it doesn't hurt them. This only eventually will help them. Yes, they'll lose some of their bottom line. And and I realize if you listen to Peter's fantastic podcast with Aaron Klein, that the the fee income for a bank of Chase's size and stature is is less bottom line focused than you know, the, the middle of the country bank that basically is profitable only because of fees. Right. But um, overall, I think banks are starting to realize that giving changing this product for their customer keeps them with customers and eventually probably exceeds the lifetime value than the fees that they would rake in over a year, two-year period. I really enjoy the fact that upstarts and innovators are forcing the hands of the traditionals um, with, and I know pain point is a phrase that I think was banned at the end of the year. (laughs) It's one of the pet peeve phrases, pain point. Uh, But I, you know, it's recognizing that that's one of the big things that consumers um, swear about. Yeah. Um, It's it's so punitive because the people that get charged overdraft fees are the ones that can least afford it. And you get charged $35 for each transaction. It's not like there's a $10 cap. And it's like, I went to the grocery store, I got milk, I got coffee, and I got a sandwich uh, at different times throughout the day. That's $109 or whatever it comes out to at the, the old structure for three transactions that barely make up the 10. Yeah. It's, just, it's a crazy way of... Uh, you know, gouging your customers. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's uh, let's move on. Uh, I want to talk about Pedal. Pedal uh, had uh, the, the first big fundraise of the year, as far as announcements go. I'm sure they closed it in 2021. But, uh, they announced, I think it was yesterday, 800 million dollar valuation, 140 million dollars uh, Series D. Um, Pedal, super interesting. Um, I think. They have uh, really done a great job when it comes to that. They were pioneers in cash flow underwriting. That, that, that was uh, sort of their big um, differentiator when they came out in 2017. And um, you know, they were the ones that sort of really developed you know, sophist- the first sophisticated models based on that. And uh, so consequently, they've really focused on these 
you know, underbanked kind of uh, customers, thin file type customers in their way. They've, they're still, do, they're doing really well. And they've, um, you know, I, you know, I see they've, they've tripled their user base, uh, still not, not huge by challenger bank standards, but they've, I'm, I'm a big fan of what they do. And I think they've um, clearly, they're not quite a unicorn yet, but they're, they're on their way. It's one of the few, I mean, I guess not one of the few because fintech is more than a few, but uh, that offer, you know, thin or no credit file, a, a product that's not insanely priced uh, in terms of credit, um, yep. you know, and, and that goes back to, you know, one what you just said about cash flow underwriting and one of your seven points for the year. Um, if you understand what's in someone's bank account and how their money comes in and out of that bank account, you can then forecast out whether or not they can afford a loan or a credit card with certain, uh, you know, with a certain credit limit. So I think that's really helped to change. And, and, you know, that goes along with stuff like, you know, Netflix and, and, and other uh, monthly um, expenditures that give a sense of, all right, this person can afford this versus I think pedals line is, you know, get credit, um, build credit, not build debt or something like that. I, th- I forget exactly how they, they say it, but um, you know, the idea of building a credit score by only going in debt um, is, you know, and now companies like pedal or, you know, we don't need the necessarily the traditional credit score. We can view you through this prison. Yep. You, you, know, you hear the um, cliche that millennials will never own real estate, partly because their inability to, develop their credit scores. So I'm, I'm always applauding when I see moves to, to shift the, uh, the goalposts a little closer. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I think companies like Pedal just do such a, such a, a service to that, that community of uh, thin file consumers because they are providing them with real credit. This is a real credit card. Um, and they, you know, they, these are, these are, People that can then they're they're in the system. Pedals reporting to bureaus and they're starting to build up their score. So anyway, um, let's move on to China because we're going to be talking a lot about China in the next uh, a couple of months because they've sort of you know they they, they keep doing more about their the um, the e one the digital currency that uh, you know they've been piloting. They started this project in 2014, so they're probably probably a decade, a decade or so ahead of most of the world when it comes to digital currencies. But the thing that's interesting is they're starting to really ramp it up. And they've, they've said a lot last year that they're going to um, really introduce this more widely when the Beijing, Beijing Olympics happen, which is about a month away now. And um, so what we heard, the news, there was a CNBC article early this week talking about um, integrating with WeChat. Now, WeChat pay... I just the article like there's 800 million um, unique users or monthly users of WeChat Pay, so 800 million, and now and AliPay has I think uh, probably just a, just a slightly less than that, but a huge huge user base, and rather than try and compete against those the, 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 those the the, um, the China China the China digital currency is going to be part of, so it'll be inside WeChat Pay, it's inside AliPay. And that's how people will be using it. Uh, it's going to be dissected very, very uh, closely how they uh, how they actually go ahead and achieve this. But uh, just super interesting and a, a smart move, I think, from the Chinese government. You can't. It's hard to fight user behavior, and it's better to sort of get them where they're actually already already using it. This is a, It's going to be a fascinating test. Uh, fascinating test. Of so, is this like the first real conglomerate super app? Well, yeah, WeChat. WeChat. I mean, we, Todd and I have been to the WeChat. The ten, it's ten cents yeah. a company. They're in Shenzhen, in just out, just over the border from Hong Kong. Um, they are. They're probably the most innovative company I've ever, um, ever seen. We've been in their offices a couple of times. They are just so in so incredible they like you can spend your entire um time on your phone inside wechat you don't have to leave it um yep. it's everything everything you can think of you do today you know whether it's you know doing delivery you know checking the weather doing fitness app everything is inside is 
inside WeChat Pay. Super app doesn't even do it justice. It's really, it's really a, an iOS type um, app. Yep. It's got everything. It's got its own, its own ecosystem. So we don't have an equivalent here. We really don't. And imagine we always used to, I used to say if Apple, Facebook um, and LinkedIn and Twitter all combined, we'd have something close to it. But uh, even that doesn't really do it justice. How transferable is this concept in North America, given the China's, you know, the, the government situation there and oversight and transparency? Yeah, I think this is something that I know that Ron Shevlin, and I, I disagree with him on this point. He says that there won't ever be a super app, a financial super app in this country because people have too many disparate things. I actually disagree. I think there will be eventually, but uh, I no one. Even, I, I agree with Ron, Peter. You do. I think there will be. Well, there will be a, a super app that I, I think will have. Won't, nothing will ever have the capabilities and the widespread usage that WeChat or Ali Alipay have. But I think we're going to have we're going to have some apps that really. It's going to take uh, you know multiple years, but I, I think we're going to have some that have massive. Like right now, you don't you can't really do any everything in one app, and. It, there's, I, I probably have, I, I have a finance little folder on my app here with, with like 10 things in it. And uh, yeah, I, check, I check most of them every day. I really think that's going to come together into one. And regulators are already trying to break up Facebook and Google and for their size yeah. and control of data. That's a good point, John. Um, I, I, not to delve it into a, a regulatory only conversation, but I don't think regulators will allow it to happen. Why do you think they've been so hard on Facebook with Libra or whatever the hell it's called these days? <laughs> they, I mean, they, they are fearful that a tech company will gain so much power that, you know, they, they either crowd out competition and they also, um, eventually price gouge there. Yeah, that's why business. there can't be one. There can't be just one super app. They've got to be, there's got to be, I think, multiple. I um, mean, yeah, PayPal's trying to do it. Square's trying to do it. Um, I mean, they'll do it to a certain extent, I think. I just don't think it will be. Like, to, like if you put the two side by side, I don't think they'll ever be anywhere near equal. Yeah. We'll have like super app light. Yeah, we'll, 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 I agree with that. I agree. What would it take to appease regulators at this stage? I think that's why you need competition. That's why it can't be one. It's got yeah. to be multiple. I mean, China has two. Um, that's probably that's one more than I expected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, China really has one. I mean, it's the government that, yeah, you know, especially these days, the government walloped both companies yeah. and, and the sector so much that they essentially are just two arms of the the government. But um, you know, the here, I think. You know, data um, issues and data privacy issues also are fearful. Like what the the issues like Facebook, Google and them have gotten in trouble with. The the regulators, especially the, the people that are in Congress, and I don't think broadly understand the nuances of a lot of this stuff. Uh, we'll kind of think of it through that prism of of misuse of data and stuff Reselling. on top of. Yeah, on top of the mo monopolistic. Uh, thing as well, which is competition. Um, they'll also start in like, you know, how do we know they're utilizing this data correctly? And, and so I think they'll, that there's a lot of, you know, potential uh, barriers uh, in place. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, let's move on. I want to talk about buy now, pay later um, because interesting article in American banker this week talking about um, how you've got, Different, different. Like the credit bureaus are really starting to take a close look at buy now, pay later. Where you've got, um, you know, Equifax saying they're going to add um, add buy now, pay later payments into you know, into their sort of credit history. Uh, really, and what was interesting to me is that Equifax research showed when when they actually bring in those people who who pay on time, who may have a thin file, credit file, um, they get a twenty one point boost by incorporating their buy now pay later activity so that's this is another sort of thing same same sort of thing that pedal does where you know, you're really bringing in those people who aren't using the traditional credit system um at all and you know that's why a lot, a lot of people will have Klarna. i mean there was a fascinating thing i just saw this afternoon that you know showed the the number of downloads that these um that these apps had over the holidays and you know Klarna's by far the biggest uh, with like 
four or five million, I think it was. But um, so people are using these apps so much, and they're 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 not part of our credit credit system right now. And that's I think that's this year. That's going to help. I think buy now pay later, pay later are going to be supportive of this because it helps them with regulators to say, look, you know, we are, we're, p- consumers love this product, and that's that's really objective reality now you can't argue that consumers love this product it's just how it sort of fits in with the rest of you know the credit uh you know, credit products out there so i think this is a good this is good news for um for everybody and there needs to be uniformity too uh because you know the, the way it's being like some there's some that that report it now but you know they'll report you know they'll make sure they report you missing a payment, but they don't necessarily <laughs> give you credit for the ten that you've made. And so there needs to be a real uniformity. So people are getting, you know, dinged when responsible uh, to be dinged, uh, and they get credit for, you know, when they should be getting credit for because it. it's very unequal right now. There's no like so there needs to be kind of a. Uh, and I mean, if the industry let it, that'd be great. I, I don't foresee that happening. So I think there'll probably eventually be a regulatory um, answer to it to, you know, have them uh, report uh, a certain way or at least, you know, the, the every other week or something like that. I've been trying to get a mortgage I paid off 10 years ago off of my Equifax for the last year. So <laughs> anything they do to update and enhance credit reporting based on reality i'm all for that <laughs> right right well the thing is as todd just pointed out there i think that we need uniformity um because one of the challenges is like like after pay sort of one of their you know one of the things they promote is this will not impact your credit you know we don't do a credit check and anyone can get 200 dollars of of uh, free um you know free credit from after pay now that whereas a firm does i mean we, we took out a we, we did a, a we financed our Peloton on a firm. We had to do it. There was a full credit check done, hard hard pull uh, done on our credit. Yep. And uh, me too. That's uh, that's how it, that's that's how they do it. So, and it's fine. Like some companies don't do a hard pull, but I think we need to have uniformity as far as um, you can't. One company can't say we're reporting to the bureaus, and another company says no, we're not going to report to the bureaus. I think that's just bad, uh, and it's not going to help regulators and nothing like that. So I think we get some uniformity. There should be a you know buy now, pay later kind of group that kind of brings all this together. Although, as we know, that they don't really like each other very much. These, these no, but I, and you bring up an important point. The, the tricky part would be at the front end. It's like, you know, Afterpay doesn't uh, check the credit score, but you, know, you, they, you still want them to report that you're yeah, making exactly. payments. Yeah, exactly. They don't have to check. You don't have it's to check. It's not the front end. It's, it's, yeah, the, it's the back end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... Anyway, I want to end um, with an uh, interesting story out of the UK this week. Um, Anne Bowden, uh, the head of Starling Bank, we've had her speak several times uh, at our European events. Uh, she ruffled some feathers um, back in October, basically saying that open banking has been a failure um, in the UK. And she said, look, she was talking mainly about account switching and there should be other things that you do. And then, so what happened this week we found out that there was a, a consortium of 53 fintech founders who wrote um, basically uh, a letter saying why she's wrong and uh, that it hasn't been a failure. And, you know, it, it's, I think it's, it's actually, I actually agree more with the fintech founders, to be honest, because you can't say something's a failure when it is still in process. I mean, it's been going, I mean, really only started going in 2018. So we've had like three and a half years these things take time. It takes time to get ad- adoption. It takes time to build products. And I, I don't think it's it's probably done as well as what everyone expected. Does that mean it's been an outright failure? I just don't think it's black and white. I think it's uh, it, that's what you know, Anne Bowden was trying to say. That. Uh, but what are the outcome? Like uh, the issue, like in some circles, this could be a giant success. Yes. It depends what what what's what's the ultimate goal you're looking to define as success. I think they were talking about this particular case. It's failed to encourage bank account switching. That was the one thing, which is really just one of many many use cases of open banking. So, it, it, like for you don't even pay, need that as necessarily a big use case as long as you can port like you, as long as your data is more portable. You don't necessarily need to change your bank account. 
Right. Well, I mean, I that, that was this is what this this was the context that it was it was. Well, yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. it's funny. I, before we came on here, I saw that Ann Bowden said they're no longer uh, advertising on on Meta or Facebook um, until uh, Facebook or or Meta uh, get their uh, data. I think privacy or fraudsters uh, fraud right. stuff under control. So. Which led me to believe that that was the motivation of this whole comment, because I couldn't understand what was what was the what was she trying to accomplish? Because as yeah. you say, it's so early in the process that making any and making a judgment based on that as the criteria didn't make any sense to me either. But maybe I'm, I was I was thinking maybe I'm just too much of a layman to understand. Well, I mean, I I, I mean maybe I think what she's trying to do is um, be controversial. <laughs> And she's 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 a tough lady. I mean, she, and she's she's as smart as they come. She's yeah. like there, there is to me. I think there's a reason why she did this. Um, I don't necessarily know it, and I don't know her motivation. But you know, she is extraordinarily sharp and has built Starling into probably you know maybe outside of Revolut the the best digital bank brand from Europe. Right. Right. Yeah, it could just be to stir the pot and get people thinking more about. Um you know, where, where it's going to go from here. Anyway, we are out of time. We have a question coming in from the audience, but we do not have time to address it right now. Um, we have gone over. Um, so great to, great to be back with you guys again. Thank you very much to the audience for, for watching uh, or listening. And uh, we'll be back same time next week. And just before I go, one quick plug, Blended Fintech Nexus happening in Miami, uh, an all meetings, all in person show. Make sure you check it out. Be there. Okay. See you next week. Bye.